We're Kyler and Cody McCormick, two brothers on a journey to pave our own path while chasing our passion. While building our adventure filmmaking brand, The Outbound Life, we become sponsored by some of the top brands in the film and travel industries, acquired Fortune 500 clients, and have spoken on stages all across the country sharing our story. We now invite you along on our journey as we sit down with inspiring entrepreneurs, creators, and diverse thought leaders to discuss how to live a life we consider outbound. A life where you believe your story matters and live beyond your limits. Come along and live the Outbound Life. All right, what's going on, beautiful people? Today, we're sitting down with a bit of what you might consider a legend. You know, there's certain people who just naturally become this kind of soundtrack to your life, a backtrack to road trips you're going on, memories you're sharing with friends. Maybe you're having bonfires, and Brett Denon is one of those people over the years. He's just always been on in the background. And he's an amazing musician, singer-songwriter, but he's so much more. And I'm excited in this episode to jump into these many sides and angles that make up this unique creature that is Brett Denon. For the past 10 years, Brett Denon, with his poet's perspective, off-kilter vocals, and insane sense of humor, has turned dancing like no one's watching into a lifestyle. As a songwriter, performer, watercolor artist, and environmental conservationist and outdoorsman, the shows he performs and the events he hosts generate more than just good vibes, okay? His impact has been to gather like-minded music fans to consistently try to make the world a better place. Brett's toured with amazing people, Jason Mraz, John Mayer, Trevor Hall, to name a few. His songs have been heard on shows like Grey's Anatomy, Parenthood, and movies like Horrible Bosses and August Osage County. Brett, that's a pretty good resume. How's it going, man? Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Yeah, uh, well, you do it a long time, you're going to have a long resume. (laughs) <laughs> that's a humble way to put it what so on, on that note when did you like first start performing when does it date back to for you well i it goes back into the early 2000s um i would say 2004 is when i really started to identify as a singer songwriter i had as a kid i'd been playing guitar and been in bands and all that but around 2004 is when I really started writing songs with the attempt to go do it on stage and Mm. to see where they could take me and to travel. And even more simply than that, it was like I was just kind of like looking for what it is I wanted to say. The way I describe it is songs and music and musicians and the music that we all listen to, that's a world. And I thought it was a way that if I wanted to be a part of that world, I would have to write my way into it. Hmm. And and in doing so, write who I am to become as a Hmm. songwriter. So if I'm going to write a love song, how do, how would I do it? If I'm going to write a protest song, how am I going to do it? If I'm going to write a song, you know, what's my version? What can I bring to the party? How do I introduce myself? And so I started doing that around 2004. And- hmm. It's really clear that a lot of your music is intentional and it comes across of like, it, it just feels like all the stories are genuine and and they go into your honest story and i think it allows listeners to be able to get to know who you are so it's like this is the first time kyler and i are meeting you face to face over zoom here but i feel like we know you through the stories that you've shared about yourself and and who you are as a person and your views on life and i think uh one song that comes to mind is a song uh titled comeback kid and you know it it kind of goes into this vein of talking about um being an underdog and and i'm curious to hear even from your perspective like did you so growing up getting into music did you have a view of yourself as an underdog do you do you view that now or what what is that relationship well that's the thing about songwriting is sometimes you you write uh things that about yourself that you may not know i don't know if i ever considered myself an underdog but i've always been really shy i've always thought that i was a late bloomer I've always thought I had something to say, but just didn't, wasn't very outward. And music has been a way for me to express positive living, which is something that has always been very inward for me. Um, It's been a way to 
just express my heart, things that are hard for me to talk about in general. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I definitely feel like an underdog now. And when I wrote the song, I don't know if it was on the tip of my tongue or not, but the words came to me and I connected with the words, hmm. <clears throat> probably because I felt that way inside mm -hmm. to some degree. And I believed in it. And that the, I, the best songs I write are the songs where I feel like I, it's something that I believe in. And so now looking back, I totally feel like an underdog. I have a, a incredible life and I, I feel very proud of the songs that I've written, but I often wish more people would connect with them and more people would have a chance to hear them. And, and I often feel like there's so many more songs that I want to write, but I don't know how to write them yet. And I, it, and it's really hard. I, I got a long uphill battle to get to those songs. Yeah. So this is interesting. I mean, the way you just described music and songwriting for you, it's like, this is almost like your path to being honest, to telling the truth, vulnerability, things you believe in, you know, Brett as an activist, as a dad, as like all these parts, it feels like the best part of you, or as you see it, you're able to express through these songs. And it's interesting that you use that tool to do that. You know, it makes me think about, gosh, it was probably a couple years back I saw the documentary on Mr. Rogers. He's communicating these really complex things to kids, but the way he's doing that is through these characters. Hey, this owl is going to teach us about grief, and this person's going to tell us to stand up for yourself. And it's like, you know, who he was as a dad or who he is just as, you know, Fred Rogers. I don't, you know, maybe I don't know as much about that person, but he used these puppets and boom through that. It's like, he's able to bring out who he wants to be maybe. So I think that's really interesting, but let's jump back to you coming up as a kid. And you talk about, you know, you're super young when you're getting into music, you're playing in bands with, with friends and stuff. But like, when did you discover that this was like something you aspired to do? When did you see that songwriting was powerful? Well, there's, there's just, there's moments throughout my life. Like I, I went to summer camp a lot in the high Sierra when I was a kid every summer and seeing the camp counselors in the mountains that I admire playing guitars around the campfire and singing songs that, that left a really strong impression on me. I wanted mm. to be a camp counselor and I wanted to be one of the ones who would play guitar and sing songs. And that's why I learned how to play guitar. And even further down the road, when I started finding my identity through music that I listened to and expressed on, that I would learn how to play on guitar, it would always kind of come back to that feeling that I had at the campfire, whatever emanates out of that intimacy of people sharing that space together. And so when I was in college and I was messing around with some bands, I was in a really cool jam, acoustic jam band with my cousin and some other people. I started writing songs that I thought could, could be at a campfire. Mm. I, I started writing folk songs, songs that I thought, you know, would be the song that you could play at a moment when everybody's about to say goodbye the next day, or if mm. people have gone through something intense together or grown together. I wanted to have songs with, with some, some, some sort of sentiment that brings us all closer together. And when I would share those songs with the band that I was in or friends that I had, and I saw them feel something from those songs, then I realized, okay, like if I'm, this is, this is something that I've been wanting to do, but this is the way I, I have to do it. I have to, I have to communicate whatever message and the message changes hmm. throughout my life, but whatever mess, whatever I'm trying to feel, which what, however I want to connect with people in life, I have to do that through music. At least I have to do a lot of it through, I don't have to do it with every song, but I have to communicate, even if it's just one song where there's just a moment, a word or, a, or the way I sing, I have to, I have to create and communicate some sort of intimacy, some, some sort of bearing my soul, some, some sort of reaching out and um, letting people know that, um, 
that I want to put some love out there. Hmm. That's cool to hear that because I think even um, hearing your like camp stories, like I can definitely resonate to that of like being yeah. a kid and like I would go to church camp, right? And like go hang out with friends. And I always loved looking up to camp counselors and seeing how they could bring groups of people together. And my inspiration wasn't as much around the music as it was like the outdoor adventure and like this possibility of like exploring yeah. and just how people come together around like a common goal and how nature ends up kind of taking away all these like luxuries of life. You know, you're staying in a little cabin, you're building fires, you're whether it's cooking your own food or out, you know, playing flag football or whatever. It just, it like brings the, the playing field down to more of a level place. And I think um, even from Kyler and my journey, our journey in building a business around adventure filmmaking and being in the outdoors largely comes from like these experiences maybe I have had as a kid of loving just taking a walk through the woods and seeing nature and experiencing it for all that it is and how that is such a place of inspiration. And I think it's, I love hearing how you found a lot of creativity from that in like being able to open your mind and experience that as we do through our um, tool of, I guess, storytelling through filmmaking. Um, a, another thing I was going to bring up is um, I remember hearing about your story and how you homeschooled for a period of time as a kid. And actually, Kyler and I both share in that, that, um, you know, it, we didn't homeschool at the same time time throughout our lives but it was like when i was really young i did and then freshman year of high school and kyler was more what kyler like middle school you well had? yeah so i think i i homeschooled for a year in sixth grade and actually hated it but i'll i'll get back to that because i <laughs> ended up revisiting it later with a different relation but yeah cody keep going well yeah and um so i wanted to bring up homeschooling because i think there's a lot of stigma around it and you know i think um you know, there were definitely times that we were laughed at as kids that like, oh, you're the homeschool kids. And totally. I mean, people probably thought we were living in some sort of cult, you know, where these <laughs> sheltered out of touch kids. Totally. And it's not until like later in life that I get to see that there's pros and cons to it. You know, I think during the, the I, you know, my freshman year of high school, when I did, I, I gained a lot from it. I enjoyed being with my family and um, being able to do that. But then I really enjoyed being in a school that had a little bit more, you know, extracurricular activities or just even being able to see kids more often, right? And learn that relationship component. I'm curious for you to hear about um, maybe how much you homeschooled, because I, I don't really know. And also what you see as pros and cons to that part of your life. Well, I was homeschooled until I went, I went to public school in junior high, seventh grade. So up until that point, it was just me and my bro my little brother and my older sister and my mom every day. My dad would go to work. He'd come back sometimes. He'd do some sort of, uh, he, he was a, a builder, a carpenter. So hmm, he would cool. do a lot of math stuff with us in the evening sometimes. You know, I don't even, I don't even recollect how often he would do it. But I do remember like math and science stuff would often be with him. We did a lot of stuff outside. Um the biggest thing I gained from homeschooling was independence. Mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time figuring things out on my own, whether it was through a book or just tinkering with something. I, from a very early age, I felt very independent and I identified as an artist. I gravitated to pens and paper and crayons and paints and I had a knack for it at a young age. And so I just went with it. I just, all day long like from the minute i woke up i'd be drawing and then i'd play and then i'd come back to drawing and then i'd play or learn to do some schoolwork and i'd always come back to drawing and i started to consider myself an artist and that was my mm. first first identity you know, so people mm. i see kids who are all into basketball or karate or whatever for me it was i was the art kid i was all always any trip anytime we go on a car ride anything i would take pens and paper with me. And so that, that and my independence was, is, is huge. I mean, it, it shaped my life. I'm a very independent person now and I'm a very creative person and I still identify as an artist even more so. Hmm. 
I don't, I'm not sure I, if, if I, 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 I would have found that in public school, but it would have been different probably because I would have found myself surrounded by judgment or clicks or pressure or whatever people have to do to fit in. Um, I lacked a lot socially as a kid. It took me a while to, f- to figure out how other kids work and social structures and mm. groups work, but I figured mm. it out. But I had so much time and I maintained such a, a quiet innocence and sensitivity. You know, I'm, a, I'm still very sensi- sensitive. I'm, I'm a little harder on the crust than I was when I was a kid, but I was a really sensitive, shy child, and I think it's good. It's good to be sensitive. That's a hard thing to be. Hmm. And um, I don't think, with it, without being homeschooled, all of those things really wouldn't have happened. And I, I would love the opportunity to homeschool my child. I'm, he's not at school age yet, but we're home with him all the time, and we're teaching him all the time. And it's cool. If it comes to it, I would, I would totally do it, and I would suggest anybody should should do it if they have to find themselves in the right situation. Because it's just a beautiful thing to spend all that time getting to know your kid and letting your kid get to know the world through their parents' eyes and the safety of their home. But uh, luckily, I had some parents who put me in summer camps and scouting and lots of outdoor Mm. activities and so i developed a real love for nature at a young age and and that got me out of the house and that expanded my mind you really have to work on expanding a child's mind and getting out of their comfort zones and a lot a lot of homeschooling i think the stigma that you're talking about earlier maybe if it's a religious stigma you know the other kids in my little town that were homeschooled were hardcore religion mm-hmm. and had they were very strict and you you never saw those kids that you know we would mm. never get together at any like homeschooling days read alongs at the library and those mm. kids wouldn't come um so if you can get out and expand the kid's mind and nature is just the best way to do that because you're immediately out of your comfort zone and you're in another yep. world a world in which you deep down you know you come from and that you're a part of maybe on a on a genetic level you know there's things in our biology that get turned on when we're walking in the forest and surrounded by trees or open vistas and mountains or fresh water or whatever it is there's things in in our, our biology that get turned on and there's discomfort and fear and joy and happiness that all just kind of swirls around together and it it opens us up and it it we long for it when we're not around it and we don't know we long for it and then when we get to it something really magical and powerful happens that that um i advocate for because i think it 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 makes us want more and and want to preach the gospel of nature and protect public lands yeah Yep. Yeah, that's that's beautiful. And man, there's a lot to unpack in there. First of all, I love, you know, where that went in, in relation to nature, because, you know, you're so right. There's a power to that to unplugging, getting off the grid and doing things that like are a bit uncomfortable. You know, I think even with things like, you know, mental health and depression and all sorts of things that we face, especially in our modern age, I think so often it's like, man, like, what would happen, whatever your experience right now, if you took a week long, you know, trip and you sat by a lake, it's like, I can't imagine that being bad for you. I think that would help. So that's powerful. But I think it's even cool just to hear about kind of your childhood and homeschooling and whatever the pros and cons of it. And certainly something like that can be a tool that unfortunately bubbles a person and keeps them away from reality and, uh, you know, cripples their ability to, to relate to the world and other people outside of their own viewpoints and, you know, I think it can be taken too far, but I think one of the things you touched on is just doing it a little differently. You did have a lot of time to really just kind of sit and, and grow in self-awareness. You know, it sounds like you're getting to know yourself. You're like, wow, I, I'm a really introspective person. I do like, maybe I'm not like this extreme extrovert and stuff, you know, like I think for me personally, cause yeah, I alluded to earlier that, 
I homeschooled for one year in sixth grade. And I just hated it because I'd consider myself a decently social creature. And, uh, you know, just, just being tucked away from all that was hard for me. So I ended up going to another school and in, in middle school and high school. And it, it, when I transferred schools, it was kind of like in the, you know, the, the absolute heights of just clicky. Everything was so clicky. You're either in this group or you're in that group. I mean, it's middle schoolers, right? I mean, we're kids. And I felt like I belonged nowhere. I felt like I was not the athletic kid, the funny kid, the smart kid. Like there was no category that I felt like I was winning at. And because of that, unfortunately, I think if I were to look back, especially that middle school period of my life, I would describe it as fight or flight. You know, I I was just trying to survive. I was trying to keep up with, man, are, are these kids wearing these shoes? Well, then I'll wear that. Are they listening to this music? Well, that's, that's who I'm going to be. There was no sense of self. So self-awareness is pretty tough when you're just trying to like stay above water. And what ended up happening for me is I kind of realized I felt a bit like a fish out of water and I was really anxious all the time. And so homeschooling for me, returning to that, which is something I didn't, I didn't think I would do again, but I saw that as something to get away from kind of the crowd. And for me, that's when I started to learn about filmmaking. It was like, I, I opted out of that and I started saying, who are my heroes? And like, there's so much I can learn on YouTube. And I would just consume and I started to come alive and tap into that, you know, that self-awareness. So I'm curious to hear from you on that topic of self-awareness, like, you know, cause you know, everybody listening, they're in different walks of life, different ages, whatever. Um, how do you think, how do you think people can cultivate that, that self-awareness, like learning who you are, what's going to make you happy and what's going to make you come alive? How is that something you can find? Well, I only know, I only know my own experience. So for me, nature, music and art, but it, it really, it, what it is, you have to get yourself in a place where you are present and you are away from the influence of thought. You're having your own thoughts. You're at peace with yourself and you're not feeling judged. And you are, you're not acting, you know, you know, we all know how we are when, when we're around different groups of people, you know, maybe you're a little bit louder in this room with people or Maybe you're a little bit more reserved and you don't make those jokes around those types of people. You know, you have to be in a situation yeah. where you don't have any of that. And usually that's being alone or being with somebody that you're totally close with. For me, it's, it's, it's cultivated through being alone. I think solitude is golden. And um, you have to get to a place where you're just you're okay with yourself. Yeah. You know, I have all kinds of things about myself where I hate this about myself and I hate that about myself, but I can get myself to a place where I'm present with myself and I'm loving with myself and totally accepting. And I love every part of myself. And when Mm. I'm in that place, it's Mm. not like, it's not like I changed my mind and um, all those things about myself, all those mean things I might have said to somebody before, or all these ways in which I've neglected the things that I love or the people I've loved or whatever. It's not like those are gone and all forgiven. I'm still aware of that, but I'm in a place where the amount of love that I feel for myself is just outweighs everything else. And, you know, I still have sad and bad feelings about the things that I want to change about in my life, but, but I feel good about myself. Hmm. And it's simple to say, but it really just comes from being present. Hmm. And it's just so hard now to do if you have a phone in your pocket. Yeah, constant bombardment. Other people. Would you run other people with phones in their pockets? Like you could be s- sitting in a car on a road trip with somebody totally amazing next to you that you think is the best person on earth and you're driving and you're driving through wherever, I don't care, Utah and it's gorgeous. And you're like, this is life. This is what life is meant to be. I'm away from 
everything that's just getting me down and I feel okay with myself and I want there's so many things that I want to do and I'm ready to try to do them and the person next to you could be that you totally admire could be looking at their phone and they could just be seeing something and whatever they see they can just relay it to you and it could just pop you out of your bubble Hmm. and it could spin your mind into another place and the odds are against us when it comes to this constant barrage of competition and buy this and consume that and be this way and feel bad about that and feel judgmental to this person and that politician and that line of thinking and these people who identify with that and they're wrong and blah 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 blah. and it's just ongoing it'll get you everywhere you go so being present really means to not to forget all about that and not to hide from that but to be aware of all that and not let get to you. Do you have any practical tips that you implement on, I mean, for instance, just a phone or like email or, um, you know, these constant things that continue to come into your mental space. Do you have any practical tips of how you're managing that? Um, when I go do, when I'm going to be in nature, go to a river or go for a trail run or go surfing or something like that. Or when I'm being creative, trying to write a song or paint a picture or something, I never let my phone be anywhere near me. Hmm. And it's something that seems so obvious, but it was really hard to learn. Like I feel the most present and the most in tune with myself when I'm doing stuff that forces me to be in the moment, like performing. Yeah. Or skiing or surfing or just walking along the water or just staring at the water or staring at a fire or something like that. Those are all situations where you don't just grab your phone and you can't like look at you. They, or if you do, it, it takes you out of that moment. So I, I had to like, realize that, oh, you know, it's these moments where I'm fully present that are the most important. And I learn the most about myself and I do my best work and I feel the best about myself and the world and everyone. So if you're going to go on a hike or if you're going to try to write a song, or paint a picture you have to make sure you don't have your phone yeah around that, you. that's so big we're so addicted you know we're so addicted and that i mean just like i think at this point in life just like the more we can subtract that seems to be the the magic pill right simplify and brett have you ever heard of the youtuber casey neistat are you familiar with casey neistat at all no so um that's okay that's okay so casey he especially a few years back, he, you know, was made one of the biggest vloggers on YouTube and just like this creative genius. Anyways, I can't, I can't speak highly enough about Casey, but recently his brother, uh, started his own YouTube channel and Casey introduced his brother on YouTube. And the way he introduced his brother Van Neistat is he said, my favorite YouTuber is Van Neistat. And the reason my favorite YouTuber is Van Neistat is because Van Neistat does not watch YouTube. <laughs> you know, he, he doesn't watch other people's stuff. He just like makes stuff. He makes these like video lectures and he he's like the ultimate handyman who's just always like, you know, fixing stuff around the house and building cool things. But I that left such an impression with me that he's like, yeah, I look up to my big brother Van and he's my favorite YouTuber because he does not watch YouTube. I can totally relate to that in, mm-hmm. with uh, songwriting. Um, if I'm in a phase of my life where I'm just like listening to a ton of music, whether it's on Spotify or my own music collection, or if it's just like, oh, I'm loving music right now. I just, if I go on a run or whatever, or if there's a new album that comes out that I really like, if I'm listening to a lot of music, I'm not being creative. Hmm. And I, I don't know exactly why, but something about a void, if I'm not listening to music at all, that's when I get ideas to, to write music. There's a, there's a void or there's an urge or maybe I just want music in my life. But I, yeah. I know that if I'm listening to a ton of music, I don't really have the desire desire to write or play music. Yeah, I think it's just like, I mean, it's hard to juggle too much and it's hard to create when you're just consuming and to take that further. I mean, that comparison voice that we all have, it starts kicking in and, oh, I should, 
whatever you start trying to copy people. Oh, that person just came out with that. And, you know, I'm sure you, I'm sure you understand that as good as anybody else as an artist. I mean, that's gotta be the deepest artist desire to be unique and to be appreciated. And when you see somebody else coming out with something else, you start maybe wondering, should I kind of be doing what they're doing? But I guess I can only, yeah, speak for myself and for Cody and my journey that, yeah, the more we just become like, honestly, totally isolated. And we're just like, we're, we're building these things, letting these, these ideas just gain momentum, irregardless of what, you know, I, I feel like on Instagram, I'm much more, I'm much less active on Instagram than I was probably two or three years ago. I don't have any idea what's going on with most people out there. And I find that's, that's been really helpful. Yeah. Um, but I'm curious. So we're talking about creation, you know, creating things and we're talking about art and, and also vulnerability through all of it. Songwriting is this tool for you to be honest, for you to share what you believe. Do you have any songs that you wrote or maybe even one song that, it was so honest and vulnerable that you're like, should I release this thing? Like, am I going to regret this? Am I, am I being too truthful here? Well, the whole album, uh, Por Favor is pretty raw, pretty Mm. vulnerable. A couple songs in particular on there would be, Oh, uh, strawberry road. Mm -hmm. Um, where we left off. Those are, I mean, I, I just think that that whole album, I, and that's sort of what I set out to do. I was not really feeling well. I was in a really sad place in my life and I had isolated myself. I was up here at this house in the mountains all by myself for a long time writing songs and, you know, I was just wanting to reach out and, and express something and, and feel loved and feel connected. And I had always re- admired albums where it just felt like someone was just totally bearing their soul and i wanted to do that and I yeah just felt, i was in a really sad place and i felt like now was the time to, to make that kind of an album and um i right before i recorded it i was just i got really sick and probably because i was just nervous about recording the songs and yeah. probably because I was sad, you know, the mind body connection, stress, you know, I, I was really stressed out about recording the album and I got really sick and hmm. you can hear it in my voice when I'm singing on that album. Like it's hmm. just all, I'm all stuffed up. And um, even that made me not want to release the album, but the big picture is I, I've, I've always wanted to have a long career and I've always wanted to make lots of songs and, and have different kinds of albums so i said you know this is this is the album that i wanted to make because i told myself a year ago that i was i wanted to mix the album like like here it is like you gotta put it out now like, hmm. you gotta put it out and get it out of your system and move on so the next record you can make is the let's and here's looking at you which is a good completely opposite you know those are loud and highly produced and yeah up tempo and more the dance party's back song so yeah everything leads something else so what 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 was that like for you to release por favor like it sounded like it was a personal journey of purging yourself right you're like i'm doing this for me i have to be honest and get some stuff off my chest because you know in that period you probably couldn't have written you know anything else you know if it was happiness it was going to be manufactured and you have these songs like strawberry road and it's like yeah, this isn't like a happy song, but for you to do that, was that like nerve wracking? You're seeing this go out and are you kind of freaked out about what people are going to think? Did it feel like a relief? Like what happened once you, you finally released that? I'll tell you, I'll give you a little bit of a story behind my thinking. I've, the way I look at songwriting is it's, it's an interaction or it's a communication. So you're expressing yourself, but you're expressing yourself in a medium, in a, in a, you know, it's a way of communicating where all the other music that you've ever heard and all the other people you've interacted and conversations you have, those are entering it. So it's like yourself and somebody else at the same mm-hmm. time. You know, if it's like if I'm a big Tom Petty fan and you can hear Tom Petty coming through in this song that I write, it's like me and Tom Petty or whomever else. Or And um, I had felt like with... The album that I had made before 
poor favor. I was on a different musical journey and I was trying to do this Americana thing, but I was also assigned to a really big record label who put a little bit of pressure on me or I felt pressure. Mm. And I was like, I want to write some radio hits and I want to, I want people to consider me more of a, a, a songwriter who's got some deep ideas instead of like someone who's just this positive, optimistic guy. I want people to feel like, you know, oh, Britton is, he's like, you know, he writes great songs like the Eagles or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I'd made that record. And then when I finished that, I felt like the, you know, the, the, it wasn't balanced. Like there wasn't enough of me, Mm -hmm. you know, like in the conversation, the communicating music as a way of communicating or having a conversation that goes two ways where it's me and everything else. I felt like there was too much everything else. And so when I made Por Favor, I wanted it to just be all me and nobody else. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. nothing else. And then when I sabotaged myself by getting really sad and isolated and getting really sick, and then I said, okay, I have to release it now. And you're asking me, what was that like? Yeah. I was really proud of myself. I was like, huh. okay, you know, I did it. I got here yeah. and I did this on my own and I did it the way I wanted to do it. It didn't come out the way I wanted it to come out. Hmm. I wanted it to come out very differently. But every song and every album I've ever made never comes out the way I want it to come out. And that's just the way I, I work. I don't, sl- I don't like get maniacal about every note and every detail. I, I let things just kind of happen as they happen in the sure. studio with other musicians and producers, whatever, or whatever I'm feeling in the moment may change from day to day. So I was really proud of it, even though it was very different than, and I achieved something very differently than, than what I wanted to, but it felt like it was really me and hundred percent me without anybody's influences. I told myself I didn't want to write any songs that were going to be radio hits. And I, I did that. <laughs> and, and so I felt really proud of doing it for myself. And I, I'm still very proud of it. And I think the thing that I really liked about the reaction it got from my audience was that people felt like I was returning to a core that I may have started from. Sure. A more sensitive, introverted, acoustic, folky place than a more loud, like a Loverboy album or Americana album, like Smoke and Mirrors. It was just it's kind of a more pure, like um, acoustic, introspective place. Yeah. Yep. And well. I did it, and now I'm not in that place anymore. Yeah. Wow. That's beautiful. And check it out. Cause like even going back to the beginning of your story and how you're, you're coming up and you're going to summer camp and you're seeing these camp counselors are sharing music with a guitar around a fire around a bonfire. There's this feeling and funny enough. I mean, one of the songs on that album you're talking about is bonfire. And, you know, quite frankly, that's the feeling I get when I listen to that album. Like I feel like I'm at a bonfire that whole time that's one of my favorite albums you ever did. I think that's so cool. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, I'm, that one's on repeat for me often. Like mm. it, it just has so much variety in it. and it's so raw. It's interesting hearing you share about the process of like being vulnerable and how, cause I was asking that question. I truly was expecting to hear something different. I was expecting to hear, um, you know, like maybe questioning, putting it out or sharing too much detail Cause I think for me to hear that, like, it sounds scary. It sounds scary to be so vulnerable. And, um, like even Kyler and I doing this podcast has been a way to kind of open up the curtain a little bit to be more vulnerable with, um, you know, people that maybe follow our journey. Like a lot of the stuff people see of us is through Instagram or through social media or, um, commercials we put out or something. And it, you know, tends to be like, and we've made it a goal to be positive and inspirational and one of the difficulties with that is people think you know people probably look at us as like oh you're just living this adventurous fun exciting life where everything's positive and there's no bad and i think for us um you know we're trying to practice more of sharing the vulnerabilities and letting people in 
on that on that journey. And I think even on that, like I'm curious to hear um, from you, there's a lot of joy that you get out of the work you do. You're a singer songwriter. You've you've wanted this since you were a, you know a kid and exploring these talents that you have. But what then, and you kind of noted at it a little bit of talking about how, you know, you feel pressure from maybe a music label at times, or um, what about your work is something you dislike? Like, are there parts that are, man, in order to do this, in order to, you know, pay my bills and live the life I want to live, I have to go through these things that I dislike. I'm curious to hear um, what parts of your work you know, aren't so awesome that people might not know about. Well, the thing I, I really dislike is um, just how you have to brand yourself and advertise yourself and communicate yourself as a brand or um, just putting yourself out there, whether it's on social media or talking about yourself. Because most artists I know have trouble communicating and they find that writing songs or painting or singing is the way that is their gift of communication that they want to share with the world. And it's something that they're good at and they feel comfortable with. And um, so it's like, oh, great, you know, you write songs and you sing them. Okay, now I want you to be an internet star personality. Yeah, yeah. I want you to, to talk about yourself and um, advertise yourself to everybody. So that's the part, everything else I like. I mean, I love the travel. I love it's nights of no sleep, you know. <laughs> I love just working hard and losing my voice. Like all of that is, I'll take that any day over, over constantly posting on social media and whatever. I do want to take the conversation backwards a little bit though, because yeah, you're saying something about positivity and vulnerability and people saying that they look at your show and what you're putting out and like oh, these guys are just positive i think that's a big misconception with a lot of people sure i think it is incredibly vulnerable to be positive i think everybody struggles everybody has times where they get sad a yeah. lot of people get depressed a lot of people get really sad. A lot of people don't believe in them, themselves. Everyone at some point in their life has been through a phase where they don't believe in themselves or yeah. lost touch, lost confidence. Positivity, positivity is not saying, oh, life is great, everybody. You know, just life is good and life is great and everything's fine and look at us. We're just, that's not positivity. Positivity right. is knowing yourself, being aware of your vulnerabilities and still putting something positive out there. It's still saying, I love myself and I love the world. And I want to, the gift I want to give to the world is something positive. It's so easy to write a sad song that's just sad. It's so easy to just tell people I'm sad. It's harder to say I'm sad and I want help because I want to be positive. And I also like still love myself and know I can do it and know I can, I have hope. It's way harder to admit something hmm. and, it, and to, and to say that you want help and you, you believe in yourself still, or you want to believe in yourself and you have hope. It's really hard to do that. Yeah. And that's what, positivity is it's in spite of everything else that's going on all the hard things you still say you know what do i want to give the world i want to put some love out there i want to mm. even though i don't feel love for myself right now i want to put love out there yeah wow that's <laughs> i'm glad you went back to that that's some powerful perspective there because yeah i mean there's these words positivity optimism and there's certainly such thing as like you know a naive blend of those things and especially a kid coming up they're just like i'm just gonna you know the world is great and you know i'm just gonna be positive and certainly as you go through life tragedy happens and suffering and you see all these areas of injustice and there's enough that you see that you, you 
unless you're blind, that's going to sit with you too. And it could be really easy to kind of take the seat of the nihilist to say, no, man, things aren't good. Life is not good. Positivity, that's bungo. Uh, there, there's a powerful story on that that I want to share. Uh, there's an author I really love, and he shared the story of this one time going on a speaking tour, and he had some amazing people he was speaking with. Uh, he was going to speak on a stage with the Dalai Lama and I think uh, Desmond Tutu. I think it's like a Catholic uh, bishop. And um, and so he's, wa- yeah, and, and he here he is. He's waiting in the green room. He hasn't met these guys before. I mean, freaking Dalai Lama for crying out loud. And sure enough, they walk in and he, he kind of has it set in his mind of how this is going to play out. He's expecting these are people who, They've seen tragedy, right? They've been around the world. I mean, the Dalai Lama, he's hes an exile, kicked out of China, right? Like this guy, man, talk about somebody who's had it bad. And talk about somebody who would be pretty serious, right? This isn't lighthearted. It's probably going to be, we're going to get together and, and kind of have this talk about, listen, we need to be, you know, we need to shine our light in the darkness and we must stay steadfast, you know, something like that. But sure enough, this guy, he's sitting here and, and the, and the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu, they walk in and what do they do? They start tickling each other. (laughs) They start tickling each other. They're like hugging and and tickling each other and just like giggling like children. And this dude's like, wait, what? They're tickling each other. What's going on? And it's kind of like, well, these are people. Yeah. They've seen the tragedy and there's horrible stuff out there. It'll break anybody's heart. Who's honest. But at the same time, what are you going to do with that? Are you going to stay there? Are you, you going to let that defeat you? Or are you going to choose a kind of positivity and optimism that says, yeah, this whole thing, this life, it's wobbly. I mean, you could die tomorrow. You could get terrible news next week. And, and because of that, we're going to, man, we're going to milk every single moment. I'm going to tickle you. We're going to laugh. We're going to smile in the face of that. And that's not naivete. That's true positivity. That That's what optimism is. That is not where I was expecting the story to go, Kyler, to be honest. But maybe I'll have to try that later on. <laughs> I'm not telling you to tickle people. You might get in trouble. But that was, I mean, that's what the Dalai Lama did. But that's the, the um, that's why... This is the reason why Bob Marley is the most important musician of the 20th century, Hmm. arguably, Hmm. is because he introduced the world to his music, not just his music, but a style of music that came from a tiny little area that just happened to be the the most harsh, poorest, dangerous places on earth. And then here comes this guy and this music that's just like universal. It's all about love and positivity. And, but that's what real positivity is like Mm. coming from that suffering and that struggle. And then everybody catches on and everybody loves it and everybody feels it because it's coming from that that real place. Hmm. Yeah, it's cool to even learn more of your inspirations and like what you hang on to of how you see different artists having, um, uh, you know, made impact and and um, not just put music out, but, um, you know, change lives. And I think um, as I think about watching how you've, um, I guess, orchestrated your journey um, you have very unique tours, tours that are very unique to you, as opposed to different tours that are just kind of like the norm. You have, you know, a concert series, the Lyft series, um, and the Vacationer series. And these are um, tours. I'd love for you to even explain a little bit about these, but the Lyft series is, you know, you're skiing with fans and then having your, um, your concerts and um, just going to destinations that you love and being able to enjoy what you love while touring. Can you share a little bit about where these concepts came from and what they mean to you? Yeah, well, it kind of goes back to uh, what I said earlier about how when you become a musician and you want to do it for a while, you have to start considering yourself as a brand and <laughs> promote yourself <laughs> as a brand. And it's really annoying to do. Yeah. So for me, ooh, 
if I'm going to do this, then I want it to be meaningful and I want it to take me places and I want to learn from it and I want to include things that I believe in. And that's, that just, that's got to be my brand then. And so with the lift series, for example, um, it's just a combination. It's a, it's a tour for music, but it brings in all these things that I love. I love mountains and I love yeah. skiing and I love getting outside. And I'm somewhat, a, I'm somewhat of an environmentalist or an environmental um, action enthusiast, whatever you want to call it. I'm all about conservation and I'm a big supporter of public lands. And um, so I try to combine music with skiing and exploring nature and learning about how we can, uh, what we can do to ensure that um, these environments that we go into are protected and healthy and thriving and not just um, being, you know, it's like skiing is, is can be ski resorts and ski culture can have a harsh impact on the environment. Hmm. So what are some organizations that are, and what are they doing that um, can help make it um, less, less of, have less of an impact? And then also, are there some organizations that are using skiing as a tool to um, heal people uh, or help people through tough times in their lives? Mm -hmm. And you know, what does that look like? So you know, this is all very vague, but I'll go to a town that has a ski resort. I'll play mm -hmm. a show, I'll ski, and then I'll partner with an organization that's doing some sort of work, um, whether it's environmental or social, that has to do with mountains or ski. And um, I'll either talk about it on stage, bring them up, or this last tour I did, we made films of everywhere we went and talked oh, cool. about the organization and gave them, gave them a somewhat of a spotlight and that's the that concept is something that i've done for a long time i used to do it with just regular touring whether i was going to new jersey or philadelphia or whatever i would try to bring out some organizations to at least have a table in the lobby by the merch stand and talk about maybe some local issue that they're working on um so it's an idea that I've been doing for a long time, but with, with these branded tours like the Lyft series, um, it's more of a focus. It's like music, skiing, nonprofit organization. That's so cool. That's so cool how like these worlds you've merged together. I mean, that's incredibly creative. I mean, that's not the typical way to do a tour and, you know, educating people through it and teaching them about orga amazing organizations like Protect Our Winters, among others, and getting to share it, it's more of an experience when people get to actually ski with you. Christina, my lady, and I, we're, we have a kid together, but we're not married. It's hard for me to say wife, but that's what I want to say. But sure. she and I started a, a goods company called Den and Goods. Oh, cool. And our motto is live well, do good. And it's the Live Series really sums that up for me because it's like, what does it mean? to live well living well is just could be you, you could say living your best life or doing the things that you love to do being healthy skiing going out and skiing being outside in nature and playing music and and trying to be happy is living well what is yeah. doing good doing good is giving back doing something for those places that you go to um giving something back to those people or to that mountain or to that town or whatever and so, like, from this moment forward, everything I want to do has to fit into that live well, do good mantra. That's beautiful. And, you know, Brett, that actually brings up another side of you. And, and again, this is one of the things I'm excited to talk about, just because we've been talking about you as a musician for all this time, but there's so many other components to you. I mean, you're a watercolor artist and an amazing one. I'd love to talk about that a little bit about obviously you started this with Christina Den and Goods and you have this awesome mission behind it. But I just want to hear kind of like what painting is to you. How does the watercolor painting side of you kind of relate to the musician? 
do those kind of like interact with each other and, and bounce off of each other? Yeah. Yeah, they, they definitely do. They flow into each other hmm. somehow. I don't know how. I don't know if it's different parts of the brain. Like one is visual yeah. and one is audio. But um, but somehow they flow into each other. I don't know. If I paint and I've been painting and painting a lot, it usually leads me to want to write. I usually get an idea for something. And when I'm not feeling inspired to play guitar, I'm usually painting a lot. And when mm. I'm not inspired to paint or I don't feel like painting, I'm probably sitting around the house a lot noodling on the guitar. Somehow they work together. I, I haven't really figured it out. I just know that um, they're related somehow. Yeah. And um, I would like, though, to figure out a way to connect them more. Hmm. I don't know how to do that. I started doing a YouTube show where I paint a picture and then I play a little music to go with it, but I'm not really fully there. It's not fully integrated yet. I would like to figure that out and then express that to the world in some way. Well, Brett, ever since Bob Ross departed us, I feel like we've all been waiting for somebody to step into those shoes, right? And teach us how <laughs> to paint and inspire us. I've loved your YouTube series, by the way. That's been really fun when you're you're doing what you're talking about. You're combining two expressions of art. You're playing songs, then you'll paint something, and you'll have your kid Van paint something with you, and it's super fun. But I just think that's cool, and I totally agree in general that, like, whether it's creativity or whatever you're, you're going to do, I mean, maybe you're like an architect working on a project. Sometimes we can be so stuck in a problem and kind of like a rut that we just think if we just work harder and give it more time, you're going to solve it, when often it's the opposite. Like I think, I don't know if, you, if you've ever heard of the author Elizabeth Gilbert, but she has a book called Big Magic, kind of about creativity, the, the creative process. And one of the phrases she describes is called combinatory play. So the way she broke it down, she would talk about somebody like Einstein. You know, here he is trying to crack these impossible equations and he would just feel so stuck. But what he would do is he would step away from the chalkboard, pick up his violin, start playing some music. And then naturally, without thinking about it, boom, the answer comes to him. So it's kind of like you're creating some spaciousness and naturally dabbling in another channel opens up whatever you're looking for in in that other one. So I think it, it makes sense. It makes sense that you're describing how when you, you paint, it makes you want to write. And when you write, it makes you want to paint. Yeah. What, so one thing as I'm thinking or as I'm listening to this conversation of you talking about these different avenues of creativity, I'm curious, how do you structure your days? Like what does a normal day look like for Brett Denon? <laughs> well, so we have... So the three, there's the three of us, Christina and I, and Van in the house. And so Monday and Tuesdays, we have a nanny come for five hours. And that's when Christina and I can both get a bunch of work done. And so on those Mondays and Tuesdays, I'm doing music biz stuff mostly, responding cool. to emails and yada, yada, yada. But then a couple of those hours, I'm painting or practicing which isn't something I like to do. I don't like to rehearse or practice music, but I got a tour coming up. So I've been doing some practicing and just be, trying to be creative. And then the rest of the week is Christine and I take turns. Like I'll take Van on an adventure one day. We'll go get out of the house, go on a hike or go to the river or something like that. And let Christina be home and get some work done. And then she'll do the same with me. And on those days where she takes him and I'm home alone, that's usually when I'm doing more of the artist stuff. Like I'm filming an episode of the paint and play, the YouTube show. I'm working on a song or I'm painting paintings to sell or painting stuff to use as merchandise for art or album art or just painting to explore. So I live a pretty pretty creative life with a couple days worth of business stuff. And I try to exercise every day too. I try to go surfing or go on a run. Cool. Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah. But I, I'm not like hanging out with friends and 
the bars or anything when I'm home. It's usually if it's, it's family time, which is most of the time. And then when I get some free time, I'm usually trying to paint or play music. Yeah. Well, I mean, even having a child is like that extra dynamic of <laughs> the responsibility of, you know, managing him and, um, managing sure that... him, my business partner here, right? Managing your son. <laughs> yeah. Well, just like, I mean, you know, my wife, Lisa and I, my wife, Lisa is, um, an artist and she's an illustrator. So, her and I, you know, we both live creative lives, but in different ways, but like, we don't have kids yet. Um, but we often think about that. So hearing your stories, I'm like, okay, maybe that would play into how we would do something as well. Cause it's like, it's an overwhelming thought to be like, how do you, how do you, uh, devote that much time to someone that needs that much attention, you know, and, and what that would bring. So that's cool to hear that. And even you're, you know, practicing music probably a little more now coming up on, a tour and this upcoming tours um, for the album, see the world. And I'm curious. So like see the world is, I guess the overarching, um, you know, uh, vision behind the album. What, what does it mean to you to see the world? Like, what does that actually mean? Well, when I wrote the album and I wrote the song, see the world, it meant um, getting out of your comfort zone and mm. going out and, finding yourself and other learning learning about yourself by being lost or being hurt or scared or out of your out of your comforts um, but after sitting on the song through uh the pandemic now i think it means something different now i think mm. it's a, a rediscovery now i think it's um getting getting the chance to do it all over again and maybe it's just me, me saying that personally, but like with a tour coming up, you know, I'm finally getting to play in front of audiences and travel to do that after a year and a half of not only not being able to do that, but think, wondering if it's ever going to happen again. And if it does yeah. happen again, is it going to be as good as it was? Or am I going to feel the same? Or it has... I'm off change me. Am I going to like it as much as I used to? Is this really my calling? Is this really what I want to do? How often have I taken it for granted? Hmm. How many oh. times have I wanted to give up or quit or just do something else? And now I'm doing the shows and I'm touring all over again. And this is like, I'm seeing the world again and all the little things that I've lost over the year and a half. Um, I'm going to get to just see and touch and feel it all over again. And, and um, it's a second, it's a second chance. Yeah. You know, it's um, what a gift. I think a lot of people are going to relate with this. You know, I think you've experienced that from your side and everyone's experienced it from their own side and to see the world again after feeling like, um it's been limited from us in you know everyone in their own way yeah it's that's gonna that's powerful that's a whole new way um because i certainly have looked at that song through the perspective of um you know wanting to get out and enjoy nature but this is giving me a whole new perspective for that yeah it's pretty it's pretty cool and uh brett one of the things we were saying before we started recording that's been really fun is your manager steve was super kind and let us listen to this album over these last few weeks and just kind of soak it in. And it's fun. I mean, there's so much yeah. jammed into that. We kick off with see the world. And I think that's going to inspire all of us who have been living in caves over the last year, but there's so many themes and so many stories that I'm really curious to hear about. And one of these songs, and you know, I know as of right now, this song isn't out yet. I think the album's right around the corner, but there's a really catchy one. I mean, people are going to be singing this one in the shower called <laughs> Paul Newman Daytona Rolex. And I'd love to hear any insight you'd be down to share about this. Is this a true story? Is it metaphorical? I, I just have no idea. And I'd love to hear what this song is really about. Sure. Well, so it's somewhat of a story. I was on tour and I don't remember where and I don't remember when, but I remember watching the PBS show Antiques Roadshow 
Ooh, love which it. It's awesome. I've watched that show since I was a kid. And uh, there was a guy getting a watch appraised. It was a Paul Newman model, a Rolex Daytona. And um, he had bought it in the 70s for a few hundred dollars. And he was a pilot. That's why he bought it. Because I guess a lot of pilots bought that watch. And he got it appraised for $175,000. Not bad. Wow. And, uh, not, yeah, I was like, wow, that's a lot of money. But I thought, like, how cool is that? Like, the guy, just he's just himself. He just has this job where he and his, all his pilot buddies are buying this watch. And it's he bought that one because it was Paul Newman. And Paul Newman's the coolest guy ever. Yeah. And I'm also a huge Paul Newman fan. All my favorite movies he's in, and he's my favorite actor of all time. So that kind of oh, like I cool. knew I was going to write a song about this. It was this valuable watch and this man that had to do with my favorite actor. So the first, but then I made the story about myself. Like I made it a story about how it's a watch that my grandfather gave me. And then I got it appraised, and but I'm not going to sell it. And this is why I love this watch so much. But that I, that really only got me through the first verse and the chorus. And this happens often in songs. I'll get an idea like that. You know, I get all the time. That would make a good song. And then I start to write it. And then it's like, well, where do I go from here? I've already told the story. And am I really singing a song about a watch? Like, yeah. do I really want to, is that what I really want to put out in the world that like watches are the coolest thing? <laughs> what intrinsic value do they hold beyond money or what, you know? And so I'm not even a watch person. I don't even have one. So huh. then I just started, then I put the song down for a long time. Like you're saying Einstein might've done or people do. And I didn't know what to do. And then, some somewhere somehow it came to me it's like well what if the rest of the song isn't about a watch what if it's about what we put a price on like if this Mm. watch is worth so much like what are the things that we value most and they what are they well they're the things that you can't put a price on Mm. they're like you know what would i really want well i would want world peace i would want to end hunger i would want to have all the grizzly bears and wolves come back i would want the rivers to clean up and the the air to clean up that would be more valuable than anything Hmm. and then it gets to this like oh are you being hokey dokey peace on earth well guess what man it's freaking hard to be that optimistic it you have to it takes a lot of courage to get up there and say, you know, if I could have one wish, I'd feed the hungry in a song, yeah. in a pop song. Like, yeah. it's, now nobody's doing that. Yeah. It's really, it's quite vulnerable to be optimistic and hopeful again. Hmm. So I thought, oh, there's a challenge. <laughs> like, I just went from telling the story about Cool Hand Luke to now I'm singing about world peace. Like, <laughs> how can I make this work? Song. Yeah. <laughs> and then I took that as a challenge and then I, I knew I had a second verse in there somewhere. Well, it works. And it, yeah, like Kyler said, it's, it's catchy and it definitely is like one of those things that, you know, I can't get the melody out of my head, which is a good thing. Um, and I'm excited for people to get to experience it and now know more of the story behind it. Cause that's, that's fun. And it's a lot deeper than, uh, I would have thought. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, this has been super fun and as we're kind of wrapping up here, if you'd be down, I'd love to just do a quick rapid fire round. We'll throw a few questions out and whatever comes out, comes out. Okay. All right, here we go. Uh, First off, do you have any mantras or quotes that you live by? Live well, do good. Love it. If if you had another instrument that um, you'd love to learn, what is it? The pedal steel guitar. Oh, nice. What adventure is on your bucket list? Patagonia. Mm. Oh, that's on mine as well. Um, what's your favorite season and why? The fall. It's the most transitional season. Like, uh, it's just the most, you can feel the air change. You can see the colors change. You can, it makes you dream of winter. 
and it just cha- I think it just changes you. I'm in total agreement. It's like the, it's the one season where like the entire northern hemisphere becomes a poem, and it, it it's my favorite. Um, okay, who's a hero of yours that you've gotten to know over the years, and maybe what's something that you've learned from that relationship? The, the last the last record I made before this one, the two EPs. I got to work really closely with a guy named Dan Wilson, who is a really well-known producer and songwriter, and he was in the band Semisonic, and he's just insanely wise mm. and insane, insanely calm, mm. and just has this um, aware, this presence, and he's just aware of everything, and um, and I've just learned his musical vocabulary is so deep. Mm. And he's rather witty and, and just gentle. And um, I spent a lot of time with him and got to know him really well. And so that would be, a, that's probably my biggest mentor right now. Mm. That's pretty yeah. special. And then lastly, Brett, we covered so much with you today, but I just want to leave them with, hey, what's next? You have this album coming out. You're going on tour. There's so much. Uh, coming here shortly. How can people follow your journey, be up to date with your tour and all that exciting stuff? Well, I want to do a lot more. You know, I, I want to build this, uh, I, I want to build this Den and Goods brand and uh, I want um, that to be a vehicle for, for me as well. I want to do some public engagement. I want to um, do some speaking. I want to live the life of living well and doing good and and bring it out to the communities. I want to do camp dinners where people come and camp out with me for an extended weekend and play music and we eat food together and explore nature together. That sounds awesome. I'll make just a quick note on the Denning goods for people listening. I personally have the painting you did of the Avid brothers. And when I saw that, I was like, this is perfect. I mean, these are, oh, cool. yeah, the collision between two of my favorite folks here in one art piece i thought that was awesome so yeah guys definitely check out denon goods and anyone to check out the tour you can just go to brettdenon.live and all the tour dates are up there and brett we just we're so thankful that you uh spent some time with us today and walked through your story i'm definitely inspired and um yeah it's it's powerful to learn from people that um you know, love what they do and, and continue to pursue it and continue to refine themselves and put an effort like that out there. So thank you so much. And, um, you know, we, we're going to come to one of your shows. So we're excited about this. Cool. Looking forward to it. Thanks guys. Yeah. Thanks so much. Real honor. A few closing thoughts, guys. First, we're so grateful you took the time to listen today. It really means a lot to us to be able to share our journey with you. Second, If you got any value or inspiration from this episode, please take a minute to leave a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. Lastly, remember, your story matters. So go for it today and live the outbound life.